my God. Been ages. <laughs> so good to see you. It's so good to see you. It's been it's a so long time. You're so recognizable with the flower over there. It's such a <laughs> difficult thing for you to oh, Deeply you. involved in the CTO now, huh? Yes. Yes, I am. Must be a challenge. Oh, it is. Big challenge. Oh. See, it's quite interesting. You actually, this was a sort of a common discussion in a way, mm. but still people want to compare to each other. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, we're trying our best, yeah. but um, yeah, when we do our because we we do events. In fact, I think I've just sent you an invitation um, to the CTO event. Mm. They all come. I feel like it's held in London. <laughs> <laughs> oh, governments hate it comes to London. <laughs> yeah, but amazing that you just mentioned was you know you just recognized this session that there is someone who wants to talk to about Africa. Yeah. Kevin can talk about you know. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's something, uh, how are you doing otherwise? Awesome. Good. I'm good. Yeah? I'm good. Thank you. Lot of oh work in travel, God. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Lord, I right. spent so long, uh, but I'm always on the diplo. You know, I'm always going there and find out what's happening, and I'm promoting it to people lot, in the uh, com Commonwealth. I always say, look, you can apply for fellowship. You know, that's what we are missing. Yeah. I remember a couple, of, like five, six years ago, there was a Commonwealth yeah. fellowship program, universities mm. and mm. stuff. Uh, we still, well, it was, it was about the IG. Yeah, about yeah. Uh, it depends on the funding too, because the common, there's another accredited uh, Commonwealth organization mm. that deal with ah. fellowship. That's the reason why. But when we have, um, like next week, I have an ITT roundtable in London. Oh, they do come, and it's part of my introduction on capacity building. I said, people are providing fellowship. There's a lot you can do. What we can do, maybe we can invest some of the online um, courses yeah. that we're doing with some of the activities of Africa, Caribbean, yes. Pacific, so it's a component of the bigger program. Exactly. That might be one Remember of the when we went to Raul Gomes, to Cook Island? Oh, I missed that. That yeah. was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Don't go away from me. Thank you for, are you coming tomorrow to your online? Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me. I'm actually hosting an ITP forum. And Let's keep it easy. Yes, yeah. all right. And let's see if we can do something. And uh, as, uh, yes, as we change, we can. Yes. So I'm but let's continue after. Oh. Let me know. In terms of the diplomacy. Johan is going to discuss it. But you read this capacity to development from the diplomacy. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah, okay. So now it's the next. Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, you have the name. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Thank you. More about the name. Is it? It's not for us. And uh, check the, check the, the speaker is our but I think she is. I think she's well, Italian. I'll find it. So uh, yeah, the position is not for people in case of anything. I'll find some people from South Africa to the top of I think I think it would be. Um, Thanks, Leonard.
Wonderful. Well, thank all of you for, for joining us. We know there's a lot going on, and uh, happy to have you in the room for, for this uh, discussion. Um, I'm sitting here with our co-conveners and hosts, uh, Brett Solomon and uh, Mila from UN uh, Global, I'm not going to pronounce your last name correctly, Global Pulse. Um, and uh, the idea here is that um, we are looking at the much talked about, and uh, Fabrizio Hostile is here as well, uh, and had an earlier session uh, yesterday that went through uh, much of the background on the high-level panel on digital cooperation. But in this session, we're focusing in, diving in, to one of the uh, very important recommendations within it, um, looking at recommendation 3A in particular. Um, and uh, I'm going to, at this one time, uh, read it for you just so that we all have an idea of what's in front of us. Um, recommendation 3A uh, looks at uh, given that human rights apply fully in the digital world, we urge the UN Secretary General to institute an agencies-wide review of how existing international human rights accords and standards apply to new and emerging digital technologies. Civil society, governments and the private, private sector and the public should be invited to submit their views on how to apply existing human rights instruments in the digital aid in a proactive and transparent process. So the mandate that we have is to really engage and, and think about what is the most effective, impactful way that we can respond to that important recommendation from the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Um, and uh, we have started to, to look at that. We have an important uh, convening coming up in December as well, organized by the Executive Office of the Secretary General. But we are looking right now at trying to get inputs from, from those that are engaged in this field about how you see that recommendation and, and where, um, where best we can take this process. Um, we thought, given that we were going to be present at the IGF, that it was a good place as well for us to put it on the table because we know there's a lot of ongoing work that really is responsive to this recommendation as well. So hearing from you about the work that you're doing that feeds into it, um, you know, obviously we're all aware of the enormous needs to move forward on a, a full range of fronts in this area and uh, are very conscious of the desire not to sort of duplicate what's already happening and really have the work that goes on under um, our response to recommendation 3A be as, as useful and practical as possible uh, to actors in the space. So uh, with that in mind, we've, we've uh, started to do a little bit of thinking about the types of, of work that could be done under recommendation 3A that could be useful. And we had the advantage, and, and Mila will say a bit about this later, of having an initial consultation on these issues in Geneva on the sidelines of an initiative by UN Global Pulse, where we got some input from people on, on what they thought how they read this recommendation and how they thought it could be most useful uh, going forward. And Brett and I thought we'd put on the table a couple of ideas um, coming out of that conversation. Um, but before I do that, Brett, did you want to give any sort of opening remarks on okay. what's brought us here? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, there's a lot of echo going on. Is that right? Or is it just me? Yeah, I can hear myself more than once, and I don't even like to hear myself the first time. So. Uh, hopefully the audio, I don't know if the audio folks are here, but if it's possible to check in on that reverb, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Brett Solomon. I'm the Executive Director of Access Now. We're a human rights and new technology organization. So we, our work sits at the intersection of new technology and human rights, which puts us very much uh, at the center, I think, of, of 3A, which, uh, as Peggy said, is really about how do we ensure that the international human rights instruments, the existing ones, um, are applied to new technologies. And there's so many instances in which um, that is not the case, right? Like if we look around and we think about all the ways in which new technologies are expressed uh, from artificial intelligence to the new technologies that we haven't yet seen or are about to see, like quantum, like what are the human rights uh, instruments that should apply to those technologies and not just apply but be implemented in real life. And what we're trying to uh, think about, of course, is uh, the sort of contemporary expression of human rights in the digital age. So what does privacy mean in the digital age? And what does freedom of expression mean in the context 
of the algorithm uh, and what does and the right to privacy mean in the context of facial recognition, for example. So I'm really pleased to be here and I'm really pleased to have this discussion and thanks a lot to the Secretary General's office for initiating the high level panel and the report and in a way the real work starts now. Dot, dot, dot. And, and I realize that having this been the third session that I've been a part of um, already today, I forgot to officially introduce myself, so apologies for that. Um, I'm Peggy Hicks. I work at the UN's Human Rights Office in Geneva and head up our work on the thematic and special procedures and right to development side, but that includes the, our work relating to human rights and technology, but also business and human rights, which is the subject of a conversation we just came from. Um, so we thought we'd lead off, as we said, just by putting some ideas on the table uh, to get the ball rolling. Um, but really, it is a very open-ended um, consultation to really seek your thoughts based on having looked at the high-level panel report, having looked at this recommendation, where you see the gaps and needs. Um, I thought the, the pull-out quote within the section of the high-level panel report gives us a real sense of, of what their thinking was, what motivated recommendation 3A. And there they said, Quote, there's an urgent need to examine how time-honored human rights frameworks and conventions and the obligations that flow from those commitments can guide actions and policies related, relating to digital cooperation and digital technology. So that's the gap they identified, and the recommendation obviously is, is a very broad statement of purpose of some of the work that needs to be done to accomplish that. But in practicality, how, how do we bring that to bear and make it useful and, um, and something that we can accomplish uh, with the resources and, and time available to us are always challenges. So we, in the context of the Geneva uh, consultation that I mentioned, um, and in conversations with, with UN Global Pulse and, and with uh, Brett and Access Now, we've started to think about, you know, what are some of the ideas that, that we could bring to bear here. Um, we also, though, wanted to flag that uh, 3A and 3B and 3C are all interrelated and wanted, of course, to, to give uh, Mila a chance to, to comment both on the role that UN Global Pulse is playing and on the, the earlier workshop uh, where it linked into that, that piece. So maybe I'll turn to you before I put the ideas on the table. So. Thank you, Peggy. Um, just to uh, introduce myself, Mila Romer from the UN Global Pulse, special initiative of the UN Secretary General on Big Data and AI. And um, we are bringing, in a way, technical expertise to the conversation of the, by the human rights experts. And the spirit of the meetings that took place in Geneva that Peggy has mentioned, um, in a way, uh, had the same uh, idea and character um, to understand particularly two issues. How how can we take forward the recommendations 3A that Peggy just outlined and also recommendation 3A which we will be taking forward together with our other champions and key constituents um, um, led by the Office of, um, uh, of um, uh, Under Secretary General Hothschild. And um, the recommendation 3C calls to think through the design and application of engineering and ethical standards and principles such as transparency and non-bias in autonomous intelligence systems in different social settings. So the work that Global Pulse does is quite relevant to this in a sense that um, we are working, we're starting a lot of work now in the Global South context. And together with the local communities, with the regional, national, and local communities, we're looking to see how autonomous and intelligence systems can actually apply in those contexts, acknowledging that we need to think about the human rights applications, also specifically specific to those contexts. In addition to that, bringing to the table the technical expertise in understanding the technical gaps that currently exist or bring in in the existing human rights instruments also brings relevance to the today's discussions. So I hope the spirit of the today's consultation will build on the meetings and the, and the discuss discussions that took place in Geneva just three weeks ago, uh, also co-hosted with the UN Human Rights Office and Access
access now. And then together we can um, identify within the community of ethicists, engineer, engineers, as well as the human rights experts that are here today at the table on how we can lean these three key recommendations, 3A, 3A, uh, 3A, 3B, and also 3C. Uh, so thank you very much and look forward to the productive discussions. Thanks, Mila. And so with those introductions, let's dive into the heart of the matter, which is really looking at that fundamental question of how existing human rights standards can apply to new and emerging digital technologies and what work could be done following on the high-level panel recommendation that will really advance our understanding of those issues. So in the conversation that Mila has mentioned and, and as I said, between us, we have three general broad ideas that we wanted to put on the table, but certainly very much preliminary thinking and um, looking forward to both feedback on those ideas, but also, you know, identification of other areas, other gaps, other approaches uh, to this recommendation that makes sense to those of you at the table. So um, the first of those ideas comes out of a suggestion made by one of the, the chairs of the uh, high-level panel process. Uh, Jovan uh, uh, was uh, present at our G uh, Geneva consultation and drew on the, the three days of, of consultations there or discussions there around privacy and, and the work that was being done to really hone in on a question that had come up in many contexts, which is the extent to which the human rights conversation, like many of the other conversations in this space, is siloed in the way that it's approached. That there is a conversation on human rights and technology, but there are other conversations happening and they're all happening in, in silos. So there's the standards conversation that is happening within ITU or elsewhere. There are conversations happening on cybersecurity. There are all sorts of silos related to the way that we look at new technologies. And one of the questions that was raised is what might be able to be done under the work that's done under this recommendation to bring a more holistic approach, to, to break down those silos, uh, commonly used phrase, I know, don't mean to be trite there, but the, the, the sense was, is, are there lessons learned in terms of practices that are being incorporated in some of those conversations that are more effective than others, are good practices on how we can best integrate human rights into the, all the different streams of work uh, relating to technologies. And obviously, um, the IGF itself is, is one of those streams in a way, and, and we're here as, as sort of a tribute to, to an effort to do that. But so that was one of the first ideas we wanted to put on the table is, is whether or not that sort of, of look at how human rights is integrated in some of the separate conversations that are happening around new technologies and whether we could use this as an opportunity to pull out and promote really some of the good practices in terms of how that's being done was, was one idea. And then the second idea that we wanted to briefly uh, bring up for you was really responding to the idea that the high level panel had about the fact that there, we needed a public consultation process, we needed a process where people are really able to feed in and put forward all the work that's already been done and is being done on the application of human rights in the digital space. And there are so many actors in the space, it is hard to really um, curate and cultivate what has already been said, what is already done, what's the reliable information in this space um, that can help those who are looking for answers to some of the questions about how the right to privacy applies uh, within certain areas of, of new technology, for example. Um, and one of the conversations that we had was that maybe some sort of online resource center or portal that could be curated in a way that would pull out the, the most important and most, um, I think, reliable, credible sources of information on some of those issues might be a useful um, starting point for some of those conversations, which in that conversation led us immediately to start talking about RightsCon and the work that Access Now has done within that format um, as, as one of the areas where a lot of that information exists and, and something that could, could feed into the portal. But that's my segue to move over to Brett and, and have you both comment perhaps on the development of that portal idea, but then also on our third area. Uh, thanks very much. And just a request as well for people who are around the edges, we'd really love you to come and sit inside. 
doesn't mean that you've signed up for the whole event, but if we can sort of close in the energy, that would be really good. Uh, and if people want to leave, they can do so as well. <laughs> so, so basically, we have three ideas. And that doesn't mean that <clears throat> there can't be f further ideas, but we've already done a couple of consultations, and this is where we've got to. So the first idea that was mentioned by Peggy, which, uh, which I think is you know, a really interesting one, is that basically we have this high-level uh, panel report, which has a number of recommendations uh, which are contained here, uh, one of which is 3A, which relates to human rights. So how does human rights apply to all of the other recommendations? I actually think there's a really interesting and kind of valuable, uh, that's a valuable exercise because human rights often ends up in its own chapter, you know, lots of things, but to actually have human rights and standards and human rights and internet governance forum and human rights, it, it does seem to have a certain efficiency to it. Idea number one. Idea number two, as you mentioned, is the portal. And I don't know if people have been involved in the IGF wiki, but there is an IGF wiki. Uh, which is trying to collate a lot of the information that's happening at this IGF. And RightsCon, which is the event that we organise, which is happening next year, June 9 to 12, <laughs> in, in Costa Rica, uh, also is thinking about how to collate and collect the information, because we have thousands of people who come and speak and, and so on, but the information comes and goes. Like, it's just, you know, presentations and talks and so on, but we don't have a place, a repository. So, um, I have some question marks about that one myself, but it'd be great to hear what people think. And then the third idea, um, and thanks very much, is that, you know, if you think about how human rights are expressed within the context of new technologies, there are a number of different scenarios that keep replaying themselves. So, for example, uh, on the issue of, uh, or on the emerging if issue of facial recognition, uh, there's a lot of questions within the regulatory environment as to how should facial recognition be managed and regulated uh, and, and often those regulators are not thinking necessarily about the right to privacy. So a scenario is um, facial recognition and regulators, right? So it would be a series of advices to decision makers with respect to a particular technology and a particular scenario that keeps happening. So I'll just name a few. One would be um, regulators and facial recognition. Another would be artificial intelligence and coders. A third would be quantum technology and parliamentarians. And a fourth might be digital identity and internet, international governmental funders. So, I just give, show you this by way as an example, and I'm glad there's a massive screen up there. Um, I don't know where the camera is, but anyway, this is just a document that we produce, which is called Do's and Don'ts for Lawmakers on Data Protection. So this is a scenario, we know that lawmakers around the world are making decisions on data protection. So how do we ensure that they do that compliant with human rights? So the idea would be a series of advices or scenarios that we could play out. And that's the third idea that we have. So we can, but it'd be also great to hear if there are other ideas, and if not, we could then move to just talk about those three ideas so that we can build on the discussions that have already happened today. Great, and with that, we'll just open the floor for your questions, comments, and ideas. Please. Um, hello, my name is uh, Christian Jeffel. I'm a professor for law, science and technology at the, uh, TUM, a Technical University Munich here in Germany. And first I would like to applaud you for this initiative and also the multi-stakeholder approach you've taken from the start. I think it's, it's really good and will uh, enrich uh, your results. Um, so I have um, two comments. Uh, one is rather an idea and one a comment on, on uh, the things you proposed. Um, my idea would be, since you have also Global Pulse, um, I think a very, very interesting new um, organizational reform of the United Nations actually doing things to realize human rights. I, I imagine that this might be a very interesting part of your work because I think one stream of the issue is how human rights protect, but um, the other stream is how we can actually realize human rights, so the realization aspect. 
And um, I think this could be an area where your report really makes uh, a difference. We see this in, in rather recent human rights instrument, like the UN Convention Against Discrimination of Disabled Persons, which has a technology clause. So this is really something that is in, in human rights. And if, if you could give guidance there and, and um, strengthen this part, there we also talk about um, social economic uh, rights uh, and their realization. I think there, this would be, um, in my understanding, a gap um, um, which, which, could, uh, which you could fill. And I also applaud you for, for the idea, uh, for all ideas, but I really like the, this um, platform you wanted to uh, create. Uh, I think it's, it's really uh, important and uh, this might be just the right setting to create such a, uh, such a platform. Um, because um, also in my understanding, there needs to be much more learning from each other. And as you rightly pointed out, there are so many projects uh, at the moment that uh, it's, it's just hard to keep up even as an academic uh, when you have a lot of time or you are supposed to have a lot of time to read. Um, uh, so I applaud you for that. I think um, the issue here will be to, um, to be inclusive um, and also to have um, um, the right stance in order to contextualize the information uh, you, you get because um, as we all know it's very important to, to display the knowledge but also to contextualize it and we see this very clear from the, from the legal sciences because often we, um, as you know, um, a law can mean something completely different in another context and those, um, those uh, platforms can be used for that. So we call that legal transplants. It's really important to give some contextual uh, information in that Thank regard. You. Thanks very much. Yeah. Sorry. First of all, thanks so much for the discussion. It's amazing. Uh, I'm uh, Edson Press, a member of a high-level panel, so I'm directly involved with, you with this recommendation. Uh, one of the initial discussions uh, to propose this recommendation is because uh, uh, several people do not understand clearly human rights. It seems very abstract. And people also understand wrongly what human rights means. Like, uh, if you consider Brazilians, I'm from Brazil, most of the people think that the human rights uh, declaration is used to protect thieves. So do not understand the human rights is about everyone. So I believe one of the, the first steps uh, for us would be try to see the implication of human rights, the implication of technology in human rights principles. Most of the discussion is around uh, the privacy. But uh, you can see that you have uh, several uh, implications, like uh, I can just make some comments here, like uh, implication in the right to life, if you think about the autonomous little apples, but not so only autonomous little apple in the medical system. If you think the use of the AI-based system for decide if you want, should survive or should live or not, can be directly uh, used in life and the machines in the medical domain. But you can think about also in the right to culture life and expression. As you know, uh, technology is not a neutral. So it can change human values. So that is pretty dangerous if you think about the adoption of uh, AI-based technology in particular communities. It can change totally the way that people interact. If you think about the uh, right to respect the family life, I'm not sure if you are observed by most of the, the, the millennials does not have uh, the ability to deal with their own problems. They are losing the ability to interact with others. So uh, I'm going to just uh, present some basic examples that for most of the people are not totally clear. So maybe uh, one point that you could see is you check some well-known reports, like uh, the report elaborated by, just a minute, please.
Sir, also, just while you're looking, maybe we could just I'm okay. try and get Okay, client, in, well. in check the mapping yeah. for a particular application to principles. Yeah. And try to see which principle is, is, is violated, yeah. is not observed, yeah. and give some example. Yeah. So that will give a clear picture about how to proceed. Yeah, I think that's actually not dissimilar from uh, the third okay. concept. It's like uh, yeah. to reuse what uh, is existing instead yeah. of try to reinvent it, do you? That is one point. Another point is to create awareness among all the stakeholders, like uh, to, to give this information, no, not to reserve this information only to a space like this one, but for Thank local you. people. Yeah. For instance, in Brazil, uh, consider Brazil, yeah. they are implemented digital ID yeah. and also GDPR. Mm -hmm. But in the media, people say, okay, if you do not provide your data to be evaluated by the banks, you have something to, to read. In. Yeah. Thanks very so, much. I think we, we understand the concept. So, and that, the point related to you know, sort of mainstreaming human rights and getting the public to understand that what human rights mean in the digital age is exactly what I think is the ethos behind this recommendation. Uh, and then specifically to find those places where we can actually have some kind of impact and real world influence as well. Uh, can we get some other comments? Yep. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, this is Nicole Carlbeck, and I lead the Business and Human Rights Program at Verizon. Uh, thank you for convening this roundtable and for the opportunity to share uh, feedback and insights on these recommendations. I have sort of a, I guess, question and comment combined um, at once, if you'll <laughs> permit that. Um, I'm, you talked a little bit about the importance of highlighting existing initiatives, and I think one of the opportunities here um, for this group to think about is the way that the UNGPs is um, being taken up both by business and also by the wider community, and how we can articulate that through, as I think Peggy, you said, different um, areas of the UN system where there may be siloed conversations going on. So I'm curious to know if you're giving thought or will give thought through this process to things like how the UN GPs are interwoven and foundational to things like the UN SDGs, which are, of course, of critical importance to companies like ours. Um, and so that's one question. On a separate point, um, I just wanted to highlight that there are existing multi-stakeholder initiatives in the digital rights space, like the Global Network Initiative, which has done some important work around setting and creating um, principles for respecting privacy and freedom of expression. And a number of companies have ascribed to those and are assessed against them. And so that is another kind of norm setting that's, that's gone on in the space and perhaps an area um, that might be useful to explore here in terms of collecting pre-existing guidance and standards and norms that have developed. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Nicole, and, and thanks uh, to the other commentators. Um, two two follow-up points on that, and, and I think it's really interesting to think about it. It was exactly that, that there are these other mechanisms that have really brought a lot to bear on these issues already, and what can we bring from that to take the next step, the next iteration? And, and I agree with Brett. Brett commented Soto Voice that he's not so sure about the portal or resource center idea. We've, we've struggled with it a bit ourselves about, you know, what's one more website, what's one more process, what's one more platform. Um, but there was a sense as well that there there are these, these specific pieces of work that have not been fully exploited in a way, fully leveraged for their impact, and is there something we could do in line with this recommendation to really bring them into the conversation in a broader sense? Um, and that would apply, I think, to you know, the, the GNI work that you mentioned, but you know, a variety of other things as well, including sort of commentary at times about how those pieces fit together and or overlap or sometimes are not necessarily on the exact same page on issues and maybe having commentary and discussion around some of the differences or, or gaps uh, between them. So that was the idea, um, but again, you know, something we're really open to. Um, and then on the UN guiding principles, uh, 
you opened the door, of course, for my uh, shameless plug of, of the session I was just in, which looks at um, the project that our office has done, is working on now, which is, is very much about a specific piece of work which we see as a direct answer, really, to the high-level panel's call under 3A, which is really to elaborate in a very concrete way what the UN guiding principles can bring to our conversations around new technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the idea there is to do exactly what Brett has talked about in terms of the scenarios, but even more you know, one level or two levels down to look at things like human rights due diligence and end use uh, end users and, and really look at what our company responsibilities using specific case-based scenarios. So we do see the work that we'll do within that project on the UN guiding principles as directly responsive to 3A and, and you know, one of the sort of the initiatives that will sort of show the commitment within the UN to continuing this forward. And, and thank you as well for making the link to the work under the sustainable development goals. I think it's really important that we emphasize the extent to which the, the company involvement, the private sector's engagement on the SDGs is, is not just a, a visceral reaction to, yes, we support them, but also brings aboard the, the concepts of the UN guiding principles that have to guide how their engagement and support of the UN guiding principle, uh, of the UN, uh, sorry, the sustainable development goals work. So how the UN guiding principles inform and give direction and content to the private sector's engagement in support of the sustainable development goals. So that's certainly something we'll be emphasizing. Um, and just to also quickly respond to one of the comments, um, actually to two of the comments, I think. Uh, one on the context and also um, the involvement and understanding of the use and non-use of AI and data. Um, be coming from the initiative that actually concentrates on the accountable uses of AI for the achievement of, to support the achievement of the sustainable development goals. We often look, or and sometimes it's been, we often look, but uh, from the policy perspective, it's been over, uh, underlooked or overlooked in the way of how we can apply uh, AI and data to um, achieve the sustainable development goals, to protect human rights, and um, and one of the um, one of the challenges that we've um, that we we still have to overcome is to actually raise public awareness on these on these particular issues. Right, Where on one on one hand we are talking about uh, privacy as a human right, but we also need to use the tools right that we currently have, AI and data, to protect privacy as a human rights as one of the examples. So thank. Thank you very much for that comment, and I think that's the reason why we started this conversation, hoping to be uh, involved, particularly within um, within the context of the recommendation 3C. And um, uh, going back to the one of the proposals that was um, uh, raised by Access Now, and um, also I think um, uh, by colleague from uh, Brazil, uh, is um, understanding also on or or what the AI and data should not be used for. I think is one of the brilliant ideas because right now there is really what what are the dawns? You know, how do we look at, um, how do we understand what the AI should not be looked, uh, should not be used for, and how do, can we uh, prohibit such uses uh, to ensure that the human rights uh, uh, remain and are protected? And um, 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 one of the conversations that we had in Geneva was also on the uh, on addressing the issues of uh, non uh, on non bias, non discrimination, and also uh, transparency. Transparency is the key tool of accountability. And mainly, what I want to bring attention to is that. These two, these two principles, particularly, are often looked at uh, from the technical or engineering standpoint. Or how can we implement it in the um, AI algorithms to ensure that they are non-discriminatory, that they are transparent? Uh, but th we should not forget, right, that transparency as well as uh, non-discrimination are the key uh, tools and grounded in human rights frameworks. So I think one of the key um, discussions or points, and uh, what I would love to hear more as well, is how can we implement such principles and how can we um, extract them from the human rights, um, existing human rights frameworks and ensure that they are embedded in all those tools and standards that are being created, the new ones, particularly also on the industry side, and we cannot, should not forget, right, 
that the industry is also coming out with the, with the, with the standards uh, to supplement the existing uh, frameworks and, and policies. And the third point is um, policies um, always lags behind. And that was actually mentioned uh, in the opening speech by the, uh, by the UN Secretary General, right? So often what, what the, the point that he made that the policymakers always stand on the, on the sidelines because they kind of observe of how the industry is paving the way forward. Um, but um, maybe we could use this opportunity as well to ensure that the policymakers, the engineers that are building the technology, the, the industry that is also making a significant impact in this space uh, can in a way work together to ensure that the policies and the standards, the existing ones, can also benefit from the experiences built in by the industry and implement the key principles of accountability and non-discrimination in, uh, in these technologies. Thank you. Um, Alex Walden, before you go, <laughs> um, I was actually literally just wanted to ask both to you and to Nicole and perhaps to the other companies, but you can also pass because, oh wow, you're sitting down, awesome. <laughs> so Alex is from, from Google. I just wanted to ask you like really just honestly, like what would be useful for you at Google in terms of this recommendation, which is like, we don't want to build a portal that nobody goes to. You know, we don't want to build scenarios that you're never going to read. We don't want to, um, you know, like, what do you, what do you, what do you from the private sector actually, as one stakeholder group that has a massive impact on new technologies, what is it that's missing for you? Um, it might not be the most interesting answer, but really I would plus one what Nicole said around pre-existing mechanisms and ways where we have already have standards. Um, because I think at Google, at other companies that participate um, at GNI and other big companies, we are still trying to figure out what the UNGPs mean for us, especially as it relates to emerging technologies. And so I don't think it's... I think it is not super helpful to start introducing new things and... Um, I think it's more important to go granular, and I think things like scenarios will be helpful, but you should feel free to work with us on those when you're doing them, because we have a lot of um, already real-world real experience that we can help um, anonymize to kind of inform those conversations, and we can talk about the challenges and the way that we've thought about them, and maybe ways we should be thinking about things differently, too. Um, but I do think, like, really, I could not say enough about the importance of the UNGPs and reminding all the companies about their responsibilities in that framework, um, and governments, too. So something like that on the UN Guiding Principles um, is actually really interesting. I mean, it's, it's building on momentum that's already in place. It's looking at existing human rights instruments and trying to further their implementation into new technologies as opposed to, I think many of us, quite frankly, just feel like I can't deal with another set of X, Y, or Zs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the companies as well are very clear that like how many initiatives do you want us to be part of? And then all the companies, other companies that are then not already part of the existing initiatives that we need to bring into them. So are there any other representatives from the private sector here? Yep. No, yeah. do, you, do you want to jump in just in terms of, sorry, you shouldn't have put your hand up. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much, Alex. Uh, I'm Brittany, and I work at DeepMind, which is an AI research company uh, in London. Um, and one of the things that I, sorry to be repetitive, um, mentioned at the consultation um, in Geneva two weeks ago was the importance of the multi-stakeholder work already happening within the context of partnership on AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard it mentioned in a couple of other sessions this morning as well, the About ML project around documentation and standards and transparency is extremely good and high quality work um, that I feel can be really instructive and will potentially overlap with a lot of the themes that you're talking about, so that can be useful. Um, and to Alex's point, these other multi-stakeholder fora like GNI and Partnership on AI, um, neither is perfect, um, and there's a lot of room for improvement, but to the extent that you can bring a lot of the discussions that you're having into those pre-existing spaces, that will sort of ease the burden, I think, for everyone involved, um, because uh, the, the, the people that you're trying to reach are already sitting around a table somewhere 
somewhere. Um, and to the extent that the conversation that they are already having needs to be more about human rights, I think there's a lot of room and appetite for that. But a new table with the same people is extremely difficult. That's not what you're suggesting, but uh, to just reiterate the fact that um, some of these spaces already exist. And I'm, I'm happy to help you plug in to the extent that you need it. Great, thanks, and, and I definitely take that point. It's been a, a lot of the thinking that yeah. we've, we've had around it as well. And, and to just sort of say that in the development of the, the BTEC project, which looks at the specific subset of this, which is the application of the UN guiding principles, we've engaged a lot with GNI um, and, and partnership uh, 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 on AI was also at the round table. We just had on, on the BTEC project. And I think it's interesting maybe for those who weren't there to just say that the three sort of focus areas, and these are all in the scoping paper on that project that um, is on our website, are the first focus area is to address human rights risk in business models. The second is looking at human rights due diligence and end use. The third, it looks at accountability and remedy. And then the fourth is actually looking at um, good practices and regulatory and policy responses to human rights challenges linked to digital technology. So it is about the state duty to protect. It's not, we're not placing it all with uh, the companies either in terms of how we bring the UN guiding principles in. And the idea within that is a very sort of um, organic process that builds from the existing experiences of companies and tries to have a uh, a discussion around what are the the areas in which more development, more discussion is needed to be able to apply the UN guiding principles effectively. I hope you don't mind. It feels like I've um, yeah. assumed the role of the chairperson for the discussion, but I'm happy to hand it We're over sharing. to any. We're yeah. Uh, so actually, there's three comments along here. So maybe we'll just take each of them, and then we can see. Um, reminding that there are three proposals on the table, trying to get as practical as possible, um, which is the review or input into the other recommendations. The second one is the, the portal, and the third one is the set of scenarios. Feel free to put a fourth on the table, but, but if you can also reflect upon those three, that would be great. Thank you. Right, thank you, Brett. Um, I'm Marjorie. I represent Chatham House, which is a Royal Institute of Foreign Affairs based in London. Um, and so one of our efforts is to obviously research the new technology governance and we have long decided to treat the tech sector as a foreign actor, a foreign affairs actor. Um, but one of our struggle, and I think that is also a little bit represented in this conversation, is that if there is a high level involvement from the tech sector, which is still quite cautious, let's be honest, um, there's a problem of integration and how do you embed those principles into you know, the daily um, discussion. And it's, it's not necessarily about management, but also at the stage of when the technology is actually developed. Because once the algorithm or the technology infrastructure is in place, reviewing it from a human rights light is useful, but actually if you embed it with the developers, engineers, it has much potentially much better impact. And so we've been asking, so what can we do? So the type of discussion such as, or could we have a checklist meant for developers, or could we have a poor memoir? Because to your point about mainstreaming human rights, um, it's not clear for everybody what it is, and how do you make sure that those type of actors, actually the people that are developing the technology, have a better understanding, and how can we support this um, from a policy perspective? Hello, my name is Madeline. I'm also with Chatham House doing an academy fellowship. Um, and apologies if the question has already been answered in either previous conversations. Um, it would be a great shame if recommendation 1A on um, inclusion in healthcare and financial services by 2030 as a contribution to the SDGs was done in a non-human rights compliant uh, manner. Um, and so I'd be interested in your reflections on how to bring these ideas to bear on that uh, goal, um, because there's obviously a lot of learning that be, can be done there, especially given the range of players in that space, from international organizations to the private sector uh, and governments as well. Thank you. 
just to comment quickly that, that we have had conversations around the human rights integration into the other pieces, that we'll have a seat at the table in, in those conversations, and the point is very well taken about how the digital inclusion and social protection sides of things have to be brought along, which I think some of those conversations are what led to that first proposal that we put on the table, is that when we think about an agency's wide review on how this is being done, it's about really looking at how, not just whether it should happen, because there is a commitment for it to happen, but are the processes that we have in place for that human rights integration to happen sufficient? So we heard from a, a colleague at Article 19 in an earlier meeting here how difficult it is that they're trying to have a seat at the table in some of the ITU uh, technical uh, standards development discussions, and it's wonderful that they're there and doing that, but the reality is, you know, it shouldn't be left to, you know, a single NGO to come up with the resources to be at that table, and, you know, how do we build on that experience and, and make sure it, it informs that the full range of these uh, efforts to implement the recommendations, I agree. And I, I think, to bring it back to one of the three proposals, this is spot on for proposal one which is like if you are going to engage in issues around um, digitally enabled financial and health services, how do you do that in a human rights compliant way? Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I think you had a comment as well. Yes, hello, my name is Katarina. I'm from the European Center for Nonprofit Law and our organization focuses on the rights of association and assembly specifically. And I wanted to just bring two points of what we are trying to do that may help bring substance to the ideas around the platform, the checklist, uh, do and don't, and um, some of the ideas you've raised. So the first one is about uh, creating coherence inside the UN mechanisms and the standards. Uh, so when we started to look at the issue of digital technologies and these freedoms, we realized that the aspect of are there assemblies online is actually questioned. And so what we are doing around that is trying to uh, document uh, the practice of how assemblies and protests are manifesting them onli themselves online and to make the case that they exist as a separate exercise. So it was really interesting for us to, to see that when you say freedoms are uh, offline, apply online, it's not so easy to un uh, kind of comprehend by the experts and by some of the regulators also at the UN level. So in addition to this practice and documentation, we are convening next week in Cambridge actually a meeting uh, between the Human Rights Committee members and experts to discuss and to, see, and to test the existing standards and say, are the standards on assembly protecting how we see assemblies happening online and the tools that are being used, and if not, then what is it specifically that needs to be added to those standards, perhaps in the general comment. Number two is we are looking at how tech already impacts this right. So as a specific action, we have convened a group at the Mozilla Festival between some uh, um, academics and um, practitioners and activists and uh, engineers and software developers. And we looked at how the algorithms are being used to uh, actually um, manage our protests on the ground. And uh, what can we learn from the current practices in both good and bad usage. Uh, and we are currently trying again to understand the use and to see what is it that we can come up with as a sort of indicators that can guide future thinking in this area by tech companies, by the uh, developers, and also in the impact assessment. So we are really kind of trying to look in a very nuanced level at some of the the practical um, exercises of the rights and the impact to bring to this process. So yeah, let's have a look and see. There's a gentleman at the back there um, and people behind. <laughs> Welcome to join in and others. And as I said before, please feel free to join us at the main table. So yeah, sir, and then afterwards with you. My name is Savel Omshambi, and I'm a researcher at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, and also the Carr Center for Human Rights, which is also at, at Harvard. Uh, and my research focuses on ethics, technology, and human rights, in particular in the Global South. And there has been some critique of uh, the different human rights frameworks, uh, different instruments, that they don't go far enough to offer what is sometimes called the third wave of human rights, the third generation of human rights. And uh, in the African continent, we have such human rights instruments, like the African Charter of Peoples and Human Rights, which offers this third wave uh, protection, such as the right to solidarity, the right to community. So I am wondering, um, amidst all of this critique, um, behind uh, 
some of these human rights frameworks that are being currently used or suggested, is there room to use um, other instruments, such as the African uh, Charter on Human and People's Rights, to try to guarantee some of the protections that the first wave and second wave of human rights have tried to guarantee, but across the African continent, we've consistently failed to achieve those protections, whether it's economic equality or, or other forms of empowerment. Should we take the next question? Yeah, yeah. let's take one more and then, thank you very much, that was super interesting, yeah. Should I continue? Yeah, actually, please, and then, yeah. Actually, it goes into a similar direction. Torsten Jelinek, um, a director at Teicher Institute. We're a think tank focusing on China, and this is where my question goes. Um, uh, obviously, uh, there is a, a division, uh, not just on human rights uh, issues, uh, but also the whole thing, digital, uh, cybersecurity, etc. So there is a, a division in the world of fragmentation. Um, um, I would not say because of just blunt violation of human rights, but maybe also a different perception. And it goes maybe to the gentleman uh, from Brazil who said maybe the interpretation sometimes is different depending on the ethical background. So my question is, and then another comment, uh, to which extent you keep the dialogue uh, with those countries which are very strong in the cyberspace, especially China, but also the Global South, uh, which uh, also see a way of uh, maybe uh, starting to protecting themselves to gain the benefits of the cyber world and the data, etc. Um, so how do you maintain the dialogue at, at these, day, these days? And the second one, which I found quite intriguing, uh, so we actually work with a Peking University uh, on the engineering of AI algorithms. And uh, there was one interesting insight is the perception is not to, um, to give an, um, presuppose a certain value to an algorithm, but let the, let the algorithm, let the AI figure out the value itself through a computational sense of self. And actually, they have, uh, they have passed this algorithm, the mirror test, like a monkey uh, could do. Uh, of course, it's a compu computational sense of self. And uh, s observed another algorithm, basically uh, the behavior, and learned from that, as opposed to uh, like an algorithm which had no sense of self, and learned actually from the mistakes. So, uh, so, so as human rights are fundamentally actually an empty you know, signifier, and they're very contextual, uh, very laudable, but is there also like a, uh, where you have a dialogue where actually the engineering can also inform uh, the, this human rights discussion and vice versa? Thank you. I'll start on the first part of the question and the gentleman from Brooklyn Klein's point. Um, look, I, I want to be very clear that uh, you know, we've had in many contexts conversations about you know, should we be talking about ethics? Should we be talking about human rights? And, you know, our, our very fundamental sense of that question is that it's the wrong question that we need to, to engage on, on both. Um, the, and so I want what I'm saying now to not sound like we don't value the ethical conversation because I think it's a very important conversation about what should happen, what, what we think should and should not happen. But the conversation around human rights is about what we're legally bound to and have agreed to do. It's what we can't, what governments can and cannot do, what, what companies are responsible for. Um, and when we get to the, the human rights framework, um, I think your, your two questions work well together because one of the things that we really emphasize is you know, actually two points. One is the universality. Yes, of course, there's cultural context, but the thing that the world has come together, including China, including states that sometimes have a different perspective on some of the rights, is that we will agree to a certain standard across all of these conventions, and, and there's tons of work that's been done, and those states do submit themselves to those processes. They're a part of the universal periodic review. They come in for the treaty body reviews. So we, that framework gives us a lot of ground in terms of universality that, that you know, it'd be uh, really unhelpful to not build on that. But the second point is that the other advantage is that the conversations around ethics, from my perspective, tend to often be a more first-generation conversation and that the, the value that's brought in by the human rights framework 
is that it does include um, you know, a full perspective on economic, social, and cultural rights, and I think through the right to development, a broader look at inequalities, um, not only within but across states. So it doesn't necessarily get us as far um, as as the question um, brought in, but but I do think yes, it's it's certainly informing the way we look at that. And when our office engages on these issues, I mean, I think one of the key precepts is about the extent to which the conversation has to be driven by an understanding of economic and social rights and the massive inequality that's you know, driving protests globally and, and how uh, leave no one behind as a principle for the SDGs is, is all about that, under, that much broader understanding of human rights that has to inform how we engage. And so this is an opportunity really. We're addressing sort of the next generation of technologies and it gives us a chance to really push on how the human rights framework can be most helpful in that context. I think you wanted to come back on the point. Yes, I wanted to add um, a brief comment on that. Uh, there has been some um, examples of how ethics frameworks and the human rights framework have been successfully used together in combination. For example, if we look at the South African Constitution, it's one of the strongest human rights frameworks anywhere on the world. And the South African Constitution is actually based on the moral philosophy of Ubuntu, which is this philosophy used across the African continent. We've seen it being used after apartheid to reconcile the nation, in Sierra Leone after the civil war, in Rwanda after the, after the genocide. And so I wonder, can we, again, you know, incorporate other ideas which have been used in various domains uh, at a national scale uh, to try to combat some of these issues um, uh, right now that we're experiencing uh, with AI and, and technology and ethics and human rights. That's really awesome. And I, the, um, the, the initiative needs to be reflective uh, of not a stagnant process, but an evolutionary process, both in terms of the developments that are taking place with the GNI and the UN guiding principles and new concepts and, um, you know, and regional concepts as well, keeping the universality and the inalienability of the existing human rights framework as the foundation of that. Um, so, um, more comments from people? Uh, thoughts? Maybe we can hear from any of the representatives from, um, from government as well, and I'm going to bring you back in as well. I know you wanted to make another comment from Brazil, but after you. Yeah, yeah of course, sorry. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Charlene. I work with the Permanent Mission of Austria in Geneva, um, covering digital issues. Uh, but I also keep, uh, keep an eye on, on the Human Rights Council whenever there's anything uh, regarding technologies coming up. And then I work with my, with my colleagues on those. And uh, in July, there was the resolution passed uh, that requested uh, the preparation of a report on uh, the impact of digital technologies on human rights. And I was just wondering how uh, that process fits into uh, to, uh, this consultation on, on this recommendation. Thank you. Do we want to hear from this gentleman uh, from Brazil? And then... <laughs> okay, thank you so much again. Uh, I would like to make some comments in relation to the standard. Uh, some standards are being currently being developed, mainly in the AI and ethics. And one problem that we face is the lack of a common taxonomy. That's the main problem for us. Because people have a different understand about the main concepts surrounding this domain. So we are facing very, 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 very great challenge in that, in that sense. One suggestion that I, that I have is, is to think about uh, to have some kind of human rights watchers or human rights help desk. If you could uh, analyze the impact of technology in each country and see, okay, you have an uh, implication. Even if the population does not understand that implication or know about it, that implication, it would be great to have something like that. Or even a human rights help desk that could uh, assist some people about some questions in relation to the particular issues, like as I commented uh, about the digital ID. Uh, a lot of people think that the digital ID is perfect, yeah. but uh, I understand that it is not. Yeah. Uh, uh, and others also. Another point, 
uh, uh, it's related to the um, to the interconnected interconnectors of the three recommendation. If you check, for instance, uh, uh, recommendation A and C, uh, this recommendation C it, it was uh, it was arise from the applica application of uh, humanitarian international humanitarian law. So we're thinking about the international humanitarian law mainly from the three basic principles, uh, distinction, uh, proportionality, and accountability. So these principles are being used to ban uh, little autonomous weapons. Mm -hmm. But I believe that this principle can be used in other domains, like as I comment for you about the end-life machines. Mm -hmm. One of the main problems uh, we are discussing here is because people that work with technology do not understand clearly the impact of the technology in people's life. Most of the people do not understand the limit of the technology. When thinking about distinction and argue that the uh, artificial intelligence based system cannot recognize properly as you expect some particular situation, you are applying the distinction principle. When thinking about the AI-based system cannot foresee the impact or consequences of a particular action, you are, you are thinking about the proportionality impact. So you can, you can easily reuse it in the legal domain, in medical domain, in other domains. So Thank you. Yeah. It would be great if you could use international monetary law and also human rights at risk, like the gentleman comments Thank you. in that particular domain. Point taken. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll quickly note on, the, on what Sabello has mentioned. Um, we had an interesting discussion, I think, and uh, hosted also with the UN uh, Human Rights Office in, uh, in Tunisia at the RightsCon, and actually a similar comment was made, I believe, by you and also your colleague, Arthur Guacqua. Um, but in a way, um, I think, you know, um, there is, and as Peggy noted, right, there is really not a question ethics versus human rights. It's really, we are discussing both, and um, I'm not sure if you were at the beginning of the meeting, but I mentioned that there, we're talking about recommendations 3A today, right? But there is also recommendation B and also recommendation 3C. And 3C particularly encouraged to look into the aspects of ethics, right? And the, and the, and the norms that address issues related to um, uh, non-bias um, and also transparency. And so I think what, you know, um, for, for the purposes of today's discussions, it's, you know, it's important to concentrate on what, um, on, the, on the tools and the mechanisms to address the human rights. The issues with regard to ethics and the new norms, and uh, as well as the issues brought up by the industry and as well as the impact assessments as the mechanisms to implement, for example, some of the ethical questions that are not highlighted maybe by the human rights instruments. And particularly, Sabella, what you mentioned about the, I think, Ubuntu and also the notion of collective rights. Um, you know, the, the special rapporteur on the right to privacy, the UN special rapporteur on the right to privacy actually a few years ago in one of his reports on big data mentioned that we need to think about uh, uh, privacy, but maybe in the context context of group harm, so maybe as group privacy. And we, we often think about privacy as an individual right, but right, but with the new use of technologies, we think about, we should, and especially I think in the, in the African context, we should think about it as, as a collective right, as a group right. So that's kind of another question, right, and uh, a question of how can we look at this and what are the new instruments that can help us think about it, and maybe humanitarian law could bring some of these concepts, but I think again we need to concentrate on the on some of the gaps, right, that are brought in by these new technologies and and um, in the existing human rights frameworks, and how can we address it, particularly with uh, with um, with your expertise. So thank you. I was just going to jump in to respond to a couple of the points. Um, with regards to the Human Rights Council uh, resolution, so there, there are actually two resolutions. There's the one uh, that gave the Human Rights Advisory uh, Committee a, a role in doing an overarching report on the impact of, uh, on human rights of new technologies, and we do see that as a sort of foundational paper that will feed directly into the work that's being done under 3A. Um, and then in uh, July, as you said, there was the uh, resolution relating to AI uh, and privacy under the privacy resolution. And fortunately, we have my colleague Tim Engelhart here, who is our point person on that. The office is really looking at how to, how to do a follow-on report to the earlier two reports that we've done on the right to privacy to figure out a way to, to really bring it down to this practical level of maybe it's a yet another sort of case study in looking at how we can make 
what we're seeing about the human rights framework useful and resonate with the broad people, you know, category of people who are trying to apply that framework in the areas of new technology. So we're looking at potentially questions like digital identity and, and other areas where the where it's not that always that that clear um, how the principles can inform some of the decision making within that uh, sphere. And to just briefly um, pick up on your comment about human rights helps help desks and, and the need for advice. Um, to me, that goes to the conversation that we've had about both at the national level, there needing to be, we've talked about this in the context of AI, it's been set up in some places, but exactly that sort of um, expert resource that can inform government policy and regulation on those issues. And clearly there's also a need at a global level that would be able to be used uh, by countries who don't have those national offices and potentially don't have the resources to, to have them quickly, um, but also to help ensure that we have some consistency across the practices that are going to be developed at a national basis. And, th you know, there's obviously the um, observatory under the OC OECD process, but the Global Partnership for AI is also talking about a center of expertise that could uh, perform some of those advisory and help desk type functions as well. Okay, so we have um, 15 minutes, I would say, that we, until we need to close up. So uh, are there any uh, additional comments uh, from uh, people who haven't yet spoken? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, and then what I'm going to try and do is just try and focus us back down to some of the practical suggestions as to how to move forward. Yeah. Um, yes. If, if I may, I would like to make a brief comment on the third suggestion, which also ties a little bit uh, into um, uh, having such a help desk and uh, helping governments uh, on a case-based um, uh, notion. Um, I would add to that uh, that another problem is anticipating new problems. So um, I, th I wonder whether you also think about, because I think the special thing we see here with digital technologies is that uh, they are emerging and, um, and it will be very important also when we think about um, group rights and, and self-determination, it will be very important to capacitate policymakers also to deal with the, techno uh, the uses of technology we do not yet really anticipate or to help them to anticipate uh, them more clearly. So uh, it's, it's a very hard uh, issue how to solve that. So um, uh, I, I know that, that it's, it's tricky, but I think this would be something very specific to, to the issue um, that goes a little bit beyond the normal tech technology assessment. So, um, so let's have a think back. Um, I think some of the things that we're seeing here, and there's, there's uh, maybe some more criteria that will help us decide, which is like, don't reinvent the wheel, I think is the, the number one takeaway, and thanks to Nicole and Alex and others. Uh, and I see it also through the Human Rights Council resolution and through uh, resolutions, I should say, uh, through the SDG, SDGs, uh, through the BTEC initiative, through the partnership on AI, et cetera. It's like, our job is not to create something new. I think our job is to both do two things. One is, or maybe three things. One is to um, ensure implementation of the existing standards to new technologies, like greater compliance. Uh, and then to, uh, secondly, um, be cognizant about the other newer, maybe third waves approaches to, to human rights and being cognizant of what the zeitgeist that we're currently operating in is, not looking back to old resolutions that don't make sense. And I think the third thing is the, the new technologies that we haven't yet you know, even seen and how to, be prepare, how to prepare for the existing human rights framework to be able to apply to that. Um, so with some of those criteria in mind, plus other things that we've discussed, um, do, um, does anybody want to have it, hazard a guess? And maybe Peggy, you can. I just wanted to add in one. Yeah. Um, which is, I also thought that there was, you know, a real sense of the need to, you know, to be more deliberate about 
the how we how we bring human rights in in a practical way that answers some of the questions that that people have. So, mm -hmm. you know, that that sort of informed both the conversation around, you know, what's happening in different fora relating to human rights, but also, um, you know, the specifics around um, making it tangible in a way that that it's clear what the impact is for not just you know a certain set of users but um, across the full range of human rights issues mm -hmm. yeah. that's that's totally fine so um, does anybody want to have a uh, I don't, I'm not hearing anything new in terms of like a new sort of tangible suggestion um, so if I put those three initiatives back onto the table uh, does um, does anybody want to sort of speak in favour of the idea of applying uh, the human rights framework to the other recommendations? So there are 11 recommendations and people maybe are not familiar with them, um, which I think is the idea suggested by yourself from, from Chatham House. Uh, I, I myself, I'll go first. I actually think this is a really smart way to do it and I'll tell you why. I think it meets many of the criteria that we're talking about, i.e. It doesn't rebuild the, doesn't you know, try, attempt to rebuild the wheel. Um, it acknowledges existing initiatives. Um, there's already momentum behind them. Many of these, you know, recommendations don't necessarily think about uh, human rights, and they should. Uh, and it's sort of like, you know, a bus that we can jump on. Um, so, but let's just talk about this particular issue, issue number, uh, suggestion number one. Anybody else want to talk in favor of it? I just wanted to say, though, Brett, that, and, and I agree with the modification, um, but I see that as, as really a subset of the broader approach that, that had come out of the earlier conversations, mm -hmm. which, which would not necessarily be limited to having that discussion across these recommendations, but would also potentially do sort of an audit or a look at, you know, what is, you know, if you, if you turn to the ITU and looked at their standard setting processes, Right. They would tell you that there is a mechanism for integration of human rights within that fora, but to really look at, you know, how is that effectively working um, and potentially to, mm. to make, you know, pull out good practices or make suggestions about how we could do it mm. further. So it was a yep. bit broader. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Please. Well, I suppose I'd f speak in favour of, of that. Um, and I could add other reasons, perhaps, just as a framing. Um, I think in putting up our, uh, Recommendation 1A, for example, um, that there it becomes incumbent on the community to uh, look at it in light of human rights. Um, because there is now going to be momentum behind achieving that goal with the support of the UN uh, system behind it. Um, and it has already started, obviously. We're you know, some years into the SDGs and there's only a certain number of years to go. Um, so we have a duty in that sense, having put up the recommendation to carry forward digitalization of those sectors um, to marry it with, with human rights considerations. Um, Secondly, um, there are plenty of tools already in place, and the number of uh, technologies that form part of, for instance, implementing uh, 1A would include AI, digital ID, um, uh, various other um, systems and processes that engage emerging technologies. So it's quite a handy form in which to bring both the technologies together and the human rights considerations together um, and the players as well. So the extent we can do that, that would be excellent, I think, yeah. Anybody else want to talk to suggestion number one? Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, yeah. First is how human rights is applied currently? Okay. Uh, if uh, human rights offline can be applied online, so we do not only to see mapping the problems that you are facing in the technology domain to the human rights principles you apply the same, the same methodology that uh, human rights is, uh, that, that you use uh, the human rights today. The second one is a more, a more personal question. Uh, do you believe that um, the human rights treaties are sufficient for the digital domain? That's a more philosophical question. Yeah. I might, if it's okay, I might just take those two questions on notice rather than try to tackle them directly because I think in the final okay, eight course. minutes or so it's going to be too complex. But I think two very relevant questions that should be applied to whichever model that we actually adopt. Um, okay, so I'm going to move us to the second. Do you want to have a go? Yeah, please. 
Hello, uh, David Kelly from the Secretary General's office. Um, my team is responsible for um, carrying forward the 11 of the recommendations, or at least coordinating the taking forward. I just want to recognize Edson, Edson's work on the panel and, and the work that he did to push human rights in every single discussion and every single meeting of the report. And he's been your champion uh, through this process. So congratulations on that work. Um, the second would be if you do decide to do a review of the different implications of, of human rights for the 11 recommendation areas, it's a good idea. But I would urge you to do it with haste because uh, the roundtables are beginning uh, the second week of December, first and second week of December. And so they would benefit immensely from any kind of review or analysis that's done. So the earlier that's done, if you're going to be prioritizing in terms of sequence, the earlier that's done, the more beneficial they will be to the process. I mean, even just an opening letter to each of the other recommendation champions and say, we understand that you're going to be addressing blah, 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 blah. And we would like to see as the champions of 3A human rights sitting at the center each of those discussions could be a useful one to at least initiate it. And you may get letters back from them about how you can <laughs> incorporate All right, I'm going to move us to the second suggestion, uh, which is the portal idea. Anybody want to talk in favour of the portal? So a place which we is a, like a repository, a living repository of existing initiatives uh, that could be available, communicated to uh, sectors that need guidance, uh, places for people to actually comment upon other stuff that's posted, etc., to be able to review and assess, etc. Um, would anybody like to talk in favour or against that concept? Yeah. Um, I will very briefly talk in favour of the concept because I think we really see that it's a knowledge problem um, uh, because there's so many initiatives and they actually replicate, um, which can be a good thing because everybody is engaged, but um, uh, I think in, in many respects it would be much better to, um, to know what's around and to have a central, central place. And I think with your connection to the United Nations, this might just be the place to, or uh, might just be the setting also with um, civil society and, and the setting to do it um, and to, to provide uh, this, this knowledge. Do you want to talk to him about So, okay. I mean, the problem that I have with that particular initiative is like, who here who runs a website has sufficient capacity to make sure that their own website is updated? One person. <laughs> um, but the point being is that it's just very difficult to keep a website from getting dust, becoming dusty and then not coming real. And so back to, you know, sort of, um, the question or comment of Nicole and Alex and others, which is about, like, this thing needs to be useful, right? And it needs to be, yeah, please. Yeah, um, I think it's important to have resources to do that. And yeah. um, uh, I'm, um, if I may add, uh, to take academic support on yeah. in this field Absolutely. might be really relevant yeah. because um, they have capacities to, to do that over longer time and have an interest also because they gather data also for, for their colleagues. So um, this, this might be a way to do this sustainably. I know that it's a lot of work, but if you have the right partners, I think it can be done. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are sort of two different ways to approach the project, and we've sort of gone be between the two of them and never quite decided whether either of them is doable or, or um, uh, recommended. Um, but one would be a very sort of comprehensive approach where you're trying to make sure that you're really pulling together what's happening as a knowledge management approach as, as, as you've outlined, which I think, you know, does give rise to Brett's comment about how sustainable is it because you'd have to keep doing it and there's so much happening, it's, it's really tough. Um, but the other possibility is to do something that's a much more curated um, approach that would, by inclusion, be to some extent endorsement as well and, and trying to look at, you know, really dividing it up according to some of the key human rights topics and issues and having sort of the, you know, what could be agreed to be some of the key resources, which might be a more manageable approach, but it also might be less useful to some extent as well. So I'm not sure which way I'd, I'd go on that and, and certainly think it's, it's worthy of, of further discussion, but, um, you know, looking forward to further comments. Um, yeah, sure. 
wondering if you know, if you, uh, it's just an idea that just came to my mind now, if you had technical partners to develop an algorithm that could potentially plug in, yeah. pull it in, and you, then you don't have to maintain it, you know, and have a human being. I mean, you would still need someone to review it, but potentially build an application that would do Thank it automatically. <laughs> Can I just comment on that? Because we did talk about that. Um, and then we got into this whole thing, but what if some of the content is actually antithetical to human rights. You're like, we actually yeah. want to have a functionality that, that points people in, in directions that we think are human rights supporting. Um, and then we got into, well, could we have content reviewers government. and content moderate, you know, and, and, and so it's a good idea, but uh, it, it's, it's not easy necessarily to implement. So, so one idea that sort of fits on top of this, and I know I've got two comments here, is, you know, as we mentioned, as we mentioned um, RightsCon, which is coming up, we are thinking, which is a, an event that sits at the intersection of human rights and new technology, and there is, as I say, like all of these content proposals, speeches, launches, presentations, reports, all happen, and we don't actually collect it. We could use RightsCon as that, as a, the entry point to the information portal, and it would get updated every year, because, yeah. Uh, real quick, comment? Um, yeah. My only comment was potentially it could be it could serve more than one function, as in more than just information. But if it's also a promotion and highlighting who is supporting what, mm. and create some sort of competition between the main actors and sort of well, you involve in only two when you main competitors and or sort of t from a tech sector, but also other organisation perspective. Does somebody else have a comment on that? Yeah. Uh, just that I was in a session yesterday where the OECD was talking about um, the work that they're trying to do to implement their principles, and they mentioned developing a policy observatory um, that also sounded similar in some regards to what you're describing about a place to aggregate information, to talk about national AI proposals, um, the sort of plethora of principles, ideas for implementation, and so on. And so some aspects of what you're describing might be similar to their work. Um, and, and, I, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware. <clears throat> Great. OK, so lastly, oh, sorry. Yep. I also wanted to lend my support to everyone who's supporting a portal to be made. Uh, I think it's in the spirit of the, what the gentleman from Brazil was saying, that the average person should have access to this information. And I think uh, as well have translations to this information. Mm -hmm. And I think this definitely falls in line with the spirit of Ubuntu, which is about openness. Yeah. So we should have access to that. We should not centralize information and, and monopolize information. This continues to assert the power symmetries, especially if the information is definitely monopolized by Western uh, you know, um, institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, suggestion number three, which is the scenario concept, which um, is trying to um, identify the pathways where human rights are either you know, sort of enjoyed or violated, I guess. Um, so on issues around facial recognition, digital identity, um, um, you know, um, algorithm, algorithms and algorithmic transparency and so on, and trying to connect that with the decision makers that kind of influence the impact and the results on those issues. And I mentioned the example of, of data protection and lawmakers or coders and, and facial recognition algorithms, etc. Um, so, um, does anybody want to talk in favour of that or against it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to repeat myself, but I fully support that, and that's why I was trying to tell you where we are trying to document so we can contribute to that within the framework of the rights, other rights. Uh, and I think it's particularly important if we find a way to go to also not just regulator, but the engineers and the uh, uh, algorithm developers, because they told us that they don't really see the impact, they don't think about it, and it would be really helpful if we can digest for them and say, these are the issues to consider from this rights perspective when you develop it. So not just that element. And it's not actually dissimilar to the first idea as well, which is about how do we provide human rights advice to existing initiatives or existing, like, the thing is that investors are making decisions about you know, where they put their money on internet service providers or telcos that have an impact on internet shutdowns. But when they're doing that investment, they're not thinking about the shutdown possibility. So how do we advise them before they invest on the human rights considerations that will have a consequence of people on the ground? That's the idea. And that fits also within, we could also make an online portal of 
those things. So we could combine the three ideas together. It actually boom, came boom. out of the portal idea. Yeah. Because we were talking about the portal and then yeah. somebody at the earlier consultation yeah. talked about a cybersecurity toolkit that was a scenario-based approach yeah. that sort of led to the discussion around it. Yeah, so it's true. Quite useful. I yeah. there was a comment here. Yeah, please. Um, I was just wondering to what extent you've engaged judges and courts as a stakeholder, um, noting just by way of example a recent case in the UK, probably High Court, but I, I get my courts wrong in the UK, um, looking at the South West Wales application, a police application of facial recognition. You may or may not agree with the decision, but the court put a lot of emphasis into unpacking the human rights considerations and the technological considerations, um, and I think they'd be a good stakeholder to have. It's, a, it's an awesome idea, and it's another one of those group of stakeholders that are making decisions that impact on rights that aren't necessarily taking rights into consideration. Yeah. Uh, just to make a, a quick comment, I'm not sure if you know about the document called the Ethically Aligned Design, written by IEEE. So we have a lot of discussions about ethics, human rights, economic aspects, and so on. And if you need some support in, in the implement this goal, I believe the IEEE could probably support okay. this Thank activity. You for follow up on that. Anybody else want to talk to the third idea, scenarios? Yep. Hello, and thank you to give me the opportunity to speak here. My name is Michael Benedis. I am the, um, the inventor and the president of the Internet Identity Card. So uh, I'm very happy to be here and to give you my, uh, my feedback. Um, yes, cybersecurity is a big concern. And I think the, the, the key, the point is that we should all work together um, in terms of cooperation between private sector and government. People, people are talking about facial recognition, about AI, but they don't really understand how it works. And this is a big concern. I am a developer myself, and uh, I know that uh, this is a big, big threat as an inventor of the Internet and the card. So I just want to say that I am here to find a way and to work together with government, with organization, to, uh, to help to solve the, big, uh, the biggest threat we have uh, in the century about cybersecurity. So if someone wants to, to share or if I, need, if I can help someone, Thank I'm you. here. Okay. Thank you so much. Just want to say that. Yeah. And I'm really glad that this issue of digital identity keeps appearing because it is one of the most, I think, um, <clears throat> one of the most important issues from a human rights perspective as a, the entry point to our digital economy and digital society going forward and very little um, considerations of governance, data protection and cyber security that the essential um, components of a rights respecting identity program going forward and yeah. So with that, I think we're at time. Yes. Um, so um, um, I'll hand back over to, to Peggy to close us um, up. But I um, would like to thank everybody for all of their contributions because it's actually been very, very useful. And if we're going to embark down this pathway, we want to make sure that we've got you know like really good input from smart people. And I think we've certainly achieved that today. So. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, as Bretta said, to all of you for participating. I think we've we've uh, worked in this not necessarily ideal setting for a, a back and forth engage, engage conversation. We've beat the system by by I think having a conversation where we've been able to really pull out some some of the guideposts that I think uh, need to inform how we approach. Uh, implementation of this recommendation, some really good ideas about how to take the, the pieces that we're trying to develop and think more seriously about them and, and to see whether they have traction with the other key constituents for this recommendation. Um, so definitely thank you for, for giving us those insights. Um, we will continue to engage across this. One of the key points is to make sure that this is not a process that's just happening in conference rooms like this in, in Berlin, uh, but to find a way that we're engaging in other locations that will allow different voices to be heard and be you know, substantively part of the process as well. So uh, looking forward to methodologies and, and uh, ways to, to do that going forward. And uh, we'll try to keep as many of you that want to be in the loop uh, as we go forward on this. Thank you. 
I just want to thank from uh, you and Global Thought separately and um, of course highlight what, what Peggy and Brett just uh, mentioned and to assure that some of, you know, a lot of the conversations that took place today and the feedback we received will also uh, feed into the discussions on the recommendation 3C. As many of you have pointed out, there is a huge linkage bet um, between all of the recommendations, but I think I believe between especially 3A and uh, B and C. So look forward to continue those discussions there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.